properly made gin martini. Um, you know, Tantris is about, at the moment, Tantris is about classics. It was the first three-star Michelin restaurant in Germany. It was the first fine dining French restaurant in Germany. And I think I'm a big fan of avant-garde everything, but it's important to not forget the classics and why they're classic. And uh, for me, still, the timelessness of the martini is, uh, well, it's a thing of beauty. For me now, Germany is the sort of the sleeping giant of the culinary universe. It's ready to just explode. Uh, there's so many incredible chefs and incredible restaurants at such a high level. So it's really been an honor to, to, to be in the mix of this um, ready-to-break scene. Uh, and the, the chefs have all been very welcoming to me. And Munich itself is really um, so American-friendly. So I've, I've been received quite well, and it's been a very easy transition. Of course, everyone can speak great English, which helps, because German is not the easiest language to learn. Italy to me was fascinating because it was such a moment in history. I mean, when you're dining there, coming from Alinea and these other dining experiences, we know the techniques, we know the, the tricks. So maybe the surprise and the majesty isn't there, but you see it's almost like a museum. You walk through all of these techniques and you know that they were born there. And then you see where they came from, contrasting with having worked with the ultimate evolution of them. So to have those bookends, so to speak, in our current culinary history, that's really cool. I'm very fortunate to have been brought there. To see Craig Schuttler's evolution from chef to bartender extraordinaire has been a joy. To see him, you know, working the canapé station of Millennia in the weeds every night to really becoming an absolute force in the world, um, because bartending is so American by design. Um, I think it's a, it's a real benchmark uh, for, again, the next step in not just having created these pre prohibition cocktails for the blueprint for everything else around the world, from Paris to Germany to Spain, but then now starting a new chapter. We'll be able to see aviary turn into something truly incredible in the next year or so, but even now, the presentations that they're conceiving and the techniques, which aren't necessarily groundbreaking, uh, but clever use, very clever use of already established technique, is really changing the way everyone looks at cocktails. And when you drink a cocktail there, it's not just about the cocktail. It, it is just an old fashioned that's in that ice ball. But how do you think about it? That's the point. It's a very intellectual experience. Liquor is always thought of as being the antithetical for intellectual experience. Everyone saves that for the 47 uh, Chambertans and the 61 Cheval Blancs. No one thinks about liquor. So that really changes the paradigm. Which is what happened to Tantris. Tantris had three stars for 20 years, and then Eckhart Pitsy Mine left, and it was, it was, of course, deducting a star. This is natural. When the chef who throws it to three stars leaves, and Michelin always deducts a star. And I think with the Trotter situation, it's not that the chef has left, but I mean, really, unfortunately, Charlie is still around, but I mean, the other two chefs are now gone as well. So, really, that kitchen has also switched over, and honestly, and both of his, of course, number two and threes had been there for what, 12 years, maybe, maybe even 15 years. So for them to leave is the same as the big name to leave, because they were really running that kitchen. So I think it's not enough time to do it. In medieval sort of France, it was your job as a song, and this was a purchase position, by the way because it was a way to become royalty without being born into it. So if you're lucky enough to drop for this position and then be able to pay for it, you're considered one of the boys with all the privileges therein, right? Which is pretty sweet, medieval times. Um, now here's the bad news. Uh, of course you're going to like 
big debaucherous meals and quaffing wine and big legs of turkey and you want the orgies and it's, you know, it's awesome. But you also have to taste every single thing, right? Every single thing the king eats, you're tasting first. Every time the king or any of the court goes on a trip, you pack their provisions. If someone's got it up for the king, and they feel like slipping a little arsenic in his turkey leg, well, you're the uh, proverbial canary in the wine shaft, yeah? That's why still today in the fine restaurants, we taste everything before the customer does, because we want to take that bullet. If it's not TV proper, we should be able to say, you know what, I'd rather not serve this to you. In the sort of late 90s, and became fashionable to become a sommelier, or I guess actually mid-2000s, even as late as. You know, you had these ridiculous concepts of, oh, well, here's our sake sommelier, and here's our wine sommelier, and here's our uh, bread sommelier, and here's our cutlery sommelier. It's like, come on, you know, what's going on here? People, the people studying one thing, getting up on their soapbox, tying a nice big fat Windsor knot and thinking that they're amazing. A true sommelier back in the day would do everything for the restaurant. They would handle the casks of ale in the cellar, properly pitching them, tapping them, and everything for the hand pull systems. They would work with the chef and even write the food menu. They would do the bookings for the front. They would handle, of course, the wine cellar. And they'd probably be able to mix a better drink than any bartender and even clip and serve cigars, walk you through an entire experience, because the sommelier was the person in the house who was the connoisseur, who was the expert on everything that fell within that umbrella of imbibing and enjoying life. And it doesn't limit to imbibing, of course, it's also dining. I want a cookie. Having observed you know, Joe Catterson, for example, for my tenure at Alenia. He, he's not the kind of psalm that will take you aside and explain every single little thing to you and, and kind of coddle you and baby you. He expects a lot out of you, but really, with him, it's about observation. And if you're patient enough, and if you have a keen enough eye, and if you listen, you can watch a true master at work. And I think, as far as wine pairings are concerned, I think Joe Catterson is an absolute anomaly. I think he's amazing. Uh, Andrea Immer uh, was one of the most important as well. Of course, she was at Windows on the World, and she was at the Seafood Grill in New York. Of course, she's now gone through TV shows and things like that. But she wrote for me the two Bibles of young sommelier wine appreciation, which are great wine made simple and great tastes made simple, because she was able to communicate every idea in such a direct manner without being condescending, nor pandering. And she just had this way of making everything sound so logical and simple. But at the same time, the concepts were so rich and deep. So she really is incredible as well. It's pretty awesome to watch uh, Adam Seeger work. Because he is a sommelier who really kind of changed the game in this city. And I speak of Chicago not because it's my hometown, but because I think it's the new culinary force in America. Going back 10, 15 years, he was really the godfather of, of Chicago cocktail. At the same time, running the great wine program at National 27, and really loving and promoting beer. And also having his own distillations from big bourbon houses, and of course, doing everything with cigars, and really just, um, such a dynamic force and totally just tearing down every convention of this stuffy old sommelier. He's this exuberant, flamboyant, just person who lights up the room and he can walk you through an entire night. Uh, anything you want, he'll make it happen. So uh, I really tip my hat to that. And that's really one of the models that I've kind of tried to follow myself, especially having been exposed to him so, uh, at relatively developmental point in my sommelier education and really watching him go was very influential on me. Visionary. Sensationalistic. Only for quality. Garbage. I am terse. Can't relate. There's too much to sort out.
fun read on a plane. What should I eat? Icon. About Great. every regret and every thought runs around. <laughs> My sheets have been fresh. I'll tell you a German joke. That would make more sense, I guess. And if you've ever studied German, this is going to make perfect sense. Uh, a Catholic priest is getting a tour of a German uh, cathedral. He's got a translator with him. The German priest is uh, speaking, giving him an introduction. The guy's talking for like five minutes. The, guy, the, the Catholic priest leans over and says, What's he saying? The other priest says, Shh, hold on, he's almost getting to the verb. Late at night when I go moment that you taste something because there is no language for that. It's, 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 it's guttural, it's emotional, and it's purely physical. When you explain a pairing and you put it in front of someone and they taste it, you sit back and you watch this profound little moment of enlightenment happen, or this elation, or perhaps maybe even they're disturbed. <laughs> um, that's really unbelievable because in not many vocations do we have the ability to provoke such a strong emotion in someone. Not only that, but be there to witness it. That to me is very fulfilling. At least you know how I feel And that's enough And it's all